and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, coming to us from Earl of Fife Games, previously known for the Universal RPG system Heroes and Hardships, now coming to us with its first with its first proper um, setting ex setting expansion. I'm not counting the minute the miniature mm -hmm. sci-fi thing sci-fi thing that doesn't yep. count. Um, with Dungeons Deep and Caverns Old, so make your Lord of the Rings jokes and your That's Dwarf right. Fortress jokes. <laughs> <laughs> the one and only Jason Duff, not to be confused with the Simpsons beer. That's right. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, I, I didn't get this. I didn't get the Duff beer joke last time, and I figure <laughs> you've gotten that joke quite a bit. Yeah, I've, I've heard it a couple times. Mm -hmm. So, with. So I think I think the first place for me to start would be mm -hmm. the origin story with this. Was this a concept that you had in the back pocket when you were developing Heroes and Hardships? Well, Heroes and Hardships, I wanted to, you know, first do a system that could encompass, you know, any genre um, that I thought that I would like to do in the future. And uh, this is one of the ideas that I had. Um, and I thought it was appropriate to do something like this um, that could um, be expanded by smaller supplements and that sort of thing. Uh, I didn't want to come out of the gate with a huge setting supplement, you know, 200, 300 pages. Um, and this was one of the ones that I had um, that could been, I, th I thought that could have used to be smaller and then grow out from there. Um, so yeah, it, it is. And, um, you know, I, I thought that, you know, the dwarf, you know, I'd never seen a setting that was primarily 100% dwarves. And I also kind of want to turn it on its head a bit and kind of change uh, a bit of what, how we think of dwarves, you know, um, very insular and, you know, uh, worried about money and, and um, gems and, you know, precious objects and that sort of thing. Um, but there's still some things with the setting that are familiar for dwarves, I think, uh, with the crafting and, uh, you know, um, kind of retaking an ancient underground uh kingdom sort of thing so yeah mm -hmm. now i'm trying to think of i'm trying to think the last time that i covered something that was so dwarf focused yeah the, the only thing that comes to mind is the buy this axe project like i covered a while back that um macris did yeah i've i've seen that but uh, i've not really delved into it at all mm -hmm. right um, but yeah. of course, of course, I are, when it comes to the inspirations, I had already, with just the name alone, that's, that's going to be referencing Lord of the Rings. Um, yep. I had already referenced, um, Dwarf Fortress. I'm not sure if that was, if that was intentional on your, on your part or not. It's just something that came to mind. But mm -hmm. what would you say would, would be some of the other, um, source materials that that served as inspiration for yeah, yeah yeah and i think you're going to be a little surprised by what it is because it's Driving. um really it really has nothing to do with dwarves at all and really uh one of the inspirations for kind of uh in a way um the adventure particularly is uh, warhammer 40k and uh the reason uh that is an inspiration for this is there's a lot of this um, sinister corruption that is uh, kind of going around in this place current at the current uh, uh, timeline of the adventure and the setting, and so yeah, that was that's actually a, a pretty big uh, influence for uh, this game. Um, obviously, not the sci-fi aspects and not not even a lot of the setting aspects, but. Um, there's a, there's two uh, primary um, motive or not motivations but influences from 40k and that's one the kind of the way the corruption works like in 40k it would be you know chaos corruptions type of mm -hmm. thing um, that can 
you know, mess with you physically, uh, mentally, and kind of spiritually. And that's why the corruption rules that are being created specifically for uh, Dungeons Deep and Caverns Old, but that can be used for other settings as well, um, and uh, are, are really kind of mimic that. And then the second thing is kind of the role you play as characters in the game as Deep Wardens, which um, kind of is an analog to the Inqu Inquisition um, as far as 40K goes. You're kind of, you know, trying to root out threats to this very lightly populated, um, very dangerous um, survivors of a massive cataclysm that, um, you know, they kind of do what they have to do to protect the whole, uh, even though maybe um, what you're doing might be morally ambiguous. So, mm -hmm. And I can, I can certainly see that, especially, especially given the fact that would you say would you say that no one would you say that no one expects them, especially since if you if you're going to be invoking <laughs> the Inquisition? Yeah, the, it's like the Spanish Inquisition. Yeah, no, I th I think honestly that people are um, a little afraid of uh, these this organization, right? And I think that really kind of harks back to 40k, and you know, is just there's a little um, there's a little fear um, just with dealing with these um, agents of kind of this. You know, uh, they kind they kind of are self regulated almost, right? Um, particularly because in the setting, the way the setting is set up is that there's no king, there's no there is a governing body, but it's kind of at your will and at your leisure uh, how much you take that into consideration, right? And that's basically there's a council of old dwarves that get together, you know, once a year. And kind of, you know, hear hear the grievances, air the grudges, and they de they determine, you know, what's going to happen between the clans. And some clans are not even a part of this um, kind of loose alliance. And so it makes it uh, interesting of what their, you know, what powers do they actually hold over people uh, in in this, you know, in this setting. And so I've um. I've met, I've been I've gone on record a few times about how much I enjoy the dwarves and say Warhammer fantasy in mm -hmm. in part because of the of going full steampunk in some cases but also them being spiteful guys. I mean yeah. everybody knows on one level about the um book of grudges. Yeah. <laughs> every every yep. slight no matter how petty is in the book. Yeah. It, it it took a it took a lot for me to not just say oh there's going to be a book of grudges you, you know because it's such a fantastic idea but you don't want to just like wholesale rip something off but um, yeah I think I think in this setting it kind of depends on uh, what clan it is particularly I think there's uh, there are some clans that are very 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 uh, grumpy um, where and you know, there's some clans that are not and I think that uh, in in the theme of the setting right there's uh, three habitable uh halls uh those are the top three uh and uh, typically those that do the more menial tasks like garbage and you know that sort of thing uh are kind of in that bottom um that bottom hall which is not as well taken care of, not as restored, and they have some slights against some of the, you know, some of the noble mm -hmm. uh, clans, if you will. And so, yeah, I think you can see that. Oh yeah, I can, I, I can definitely see it. One, per, is, and I do appreciate having the um, map example on the Kickstarter showing the mm -hmm. third hall of splendor because. Yep. As I, as I understand it, these halls of splendor were akin akin to, I guess I guess some um, cities within within the within the yeah cities. yeah or just yeah just just uh, cities or huge um, uh, living areas um, with different you know towns almost um, maybe not the scope of cities exactly maybe uh, you know the first hall of splendor is bigger. Um, but if you look at the third hall of splendor, you can see kind of like the function of it, particularly, right? A lot of craftsmen, a lot of uh, menial, you know, tasks like waste disposal, um, which 
you know, in the, in this is just basically chasms in certain parts of the of the hall that they just dump their garbage uh, and probably refuse and other things. Hmm. Um, and uh, you know, anything below the third hall is um, is prohibited to go down um, because of just the state of how that is and the state of the um, the you know the actual hall and you know the structure and the dangers down there nobody is supposed to go down there because they don't want anything to come up um, and and the halls themselves are repurposed right uh, the idea is that there is this giant cataclysm on the surface and all these dwarves that are currently in this uh, in the halls of splendor the old kingdom as it's called uh, were actually surface dwellers and uh, they, there was this, you know, myth or rumor about this place, um, this old, old uh, dwarven kingdom that was beneath the beneath the surface. And they found it when there was this cataclysm, and they started fleeing the surface and came into this place again and repurposed it. So, mm-hmm. so. <clears throat> With that, with that, with that said, do you can do you consider Dungeons Deep to be a campaign setting or an adventure? Do you consider it to be both? It's both. Um, so the way it's kind of written is uh, there's three three sections to the book. There's a, a setting section, an adventure section, and a rules section. Um, and Dungeons Deep and Caverns Old itself is more the setting. Secrets of the Sacred Stone is more of the adventure. Um, what I'm kind of experimenting with how this is uh, laid out and written for people, whereas, um, you know, there is a solid first section of setting to kind of get you going. Um, but the adventure itself, um, where needed, uh, there is a contextual third sidebar with setting information, particularly, that will explain things that are happening in the adventure uh, from a setting point of view, if needed. Um, and so you can learn more about the setting uh, by, by, you know, taking on the adventure at, at, at that time as well, instead of just reading, you know, a bunch of stuff about the setting, then taking the adventure and then kind of contextualizing it from something that was written or read before so yeah <clears throat> i am cu- i am curious if um especially given the whole concept of delving if somebody has mm-hmm. brought up deep rock galactic to you deep rock no uh uh-uh. um that now granted that's more science fiction dwarf but it is de- it is dealing with delving into these areas where you're pro- where um, the risk of death is a occupational hazard. Mm-hmm. No, 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 no one has. Um, I think in this setting, uh, if, if the further down you go, the more danger it is for sure. So, mm-hmm. which provides a which there's plenty of we've seen plenty of games that d- that do that concept. I suppose the the biggest example on the video game front is going to be Darkest Dungeon, which I've mm-hmm. always called a protracted game of chicken. Yeah, <laughs> right. At any point, you can always you can always back away and call and call it a night. Yep. But, but yeah, if you cho- if you choose to keep going deep go- going deeper, um, and things go south, it's your own damn fault. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The the this this particular supplement there in an adventure there's going to be uh, there's going to be opportunity to go into that fourth hall um which is um not uh, allowed typically um and see what's down there and kind of investigate it and then there's going to be information for people who want to make their own you know adventures out of this um, this supplement and uh, you know information about what might be down there, what it's like, that sort of thing. So, mm-hmm. now <clears throat> with the, with that said, as I, because of the fact that you that one could easily are one could easily look this look at this as a mega dungeon. Um, mm-hmm. Do you pl- do you plan on having some some sort of in- some sort of encounter table or the like to in- to make sure that going down there isn't a set thing, or do you have set floors that you're going to be doing 
within the um, adventure? Well, the adventure isn't um, 100 percent uh, linear or 100 percent sandbox. Um, so there is going to be um, kind of open for your exploration. Um, that fourth uh, that fourth level, um, pretty much in the adventure, there's uh, only certain places that you can go. Um, in the adventure itself, and it will, like I said, it's going to describe um, without, you know, uh, getting into an entire n new map and detail for that level, uh, explain kind of what could be down there, um, what uh, areas, what are the major areas down there if you, you know, uh, decide you want to make that a part of your adventure. Um, so there will be, like, you know, you can see these adversaries. You can see uh, this kind of terrain. You can, And these are the problems you might uh, experience. So, yeah, there's going to be something like that. Um, as Because uh, if you want, like I say, if you want to do your own thing down there, you'll be able to incorporate that in your in your games. Now, given the clan system that the dwarves have in this setting, do you plan on going into detail of a few example clans and what their relationships yes. are with each other? Yes. Um, any important clan to the game, uh, to the adventure specifically, will be called out. Uh, so there, you know, you have a context of, you know, in character what these clans might mean to you. Um, so yeah, there's going to be that. Um, and then there's going to be, um, you know, there's not going to be a life path in this um, in this supplement, but there's going to be also, you know, there's going to be like, okay, um, a different type of, um, you know, uh, so in, in the core rule book, there's, you know, one ancestry for dwarves, right? This is going to have several ancestries for dwarves based on um, where you come from in the, in the uh, kingdom. And so, uh, or the old kingdom, and so there, there's extras if you want to do a different kind of dwarf. You could even take those and you know put them in your own game if you prefer those ancestries above hmm. what's in the core rule book, right? Yeah, I can, I can certainly get that. Um, and coming from the clan system of something like L5R, I'm, I'm always mm -hmm. a fan of how they interact with each other because not all are created equal, and not all are going to get along with each other. Yes, then that's definitely the case here. Um, there will be, uh, you know, there there'll be several clans that are called out, and kind of what their political motivations are, what are you know, and and so on and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned on the Kickstarter that this is designed for power level one. It is, and I think this is even though we're building off of the previous interview, I think this is as good a time as any to explain the power level system that ha that Heroes of Hardships has, because yeah. some people, this is going to be the first introduction, and how yeah. that differs from a traditional level system. Yeah, so, so power levels are um, based on the entire, or they affect the entire game. Um, the power levels that uh, you can play in Heroes and Hardships today is one through four. The fourth one is introduced in the GM's Guide, mm -hmm. um, and one through three is in the core rulebook. Um, the way this works is for power level one, we'll say uh, you're going to have a certain amount of um, attribute points to apply to your character, um, or your roles are going to skew higher uh, for the higher power levels. Um, so basically, the higher power level you have, the stronger your character is, um, and the stronger your adversaries are. Um, so you're going to roll more dice, you're going to have higher results, etc. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing to keep in mind is your static uh, difficulties are also going to scale with you, um, unless it's the mundane, uh, which is always a 10, but uh, everything is going to scale with you. So, uh, when when you're in power level two and it says make a challenging skill check, that's different from what it would be on on power level one. Um, so the world kind of scales with you, and then you can do things if you want to. Is you can uh, the one thing that is is very clear. You must always use 
the difficulty levels for whatever the game's power level is. However, you can make your adversaries power level two in a power level one game if you want them to be super, super powerful um, and super, you know, a, a big challenge. Um, so that's how power levels work. And so that that allows uh, Heroes and Hardships as itself to kind of mimic, you know, super powerful characters like superheroes and, you know, extremely high fantasy type stuff. And then uh, all the way down to grunts in the dirt, you know, very, very, very gritty games. So Yeah, so get, given that, especially since even though this is designed for power level one, that there is no assumption mm -hmm. that that's what people are going to be sticking with. Yeah. I, I feel like this is as, as good of a, t a time to go into um, what would what would be some examples from from other media for the three um, power levels? You mentioned you mentioned sure. So for, so yeah. some other ones for power level one would be what? Well, power level one, you could any kind of um, let me just think for a second. Uh, you know, as far as your normal kind of um, let's see. Power level one. What would be power level one? What's a good example? Uh, power level one could be something, uh, it, you know, and it doesn't, power level one doesn't necessarily mean there's no magic. It doesn't necessarily mean there's no powers, anything like that. That's not what it's saying. It's just saying everything is less powerful um, that you can do. Um, now, that's up to the GM to say if there's magic or whatever. That's that's completely a different question. Um, but power level one, if, if you're looking at things I can think of off the top of my head, things like, um, you know, uh, Vikings or um, the, last, um, uh, the Last Kingdom. Uh, I'm trying to think of now fantasy options. Uh, like uh, The Expanse would be a sci-fi, probably, power level one setting. Um, what else? Let's see. Um, I'm trying to think of a good fantasy example. The Witcher. I would say not actually. I because I actually ran a uh, Witcher campaign and I actually made that a, a power level two game mm -hmm. um, because there's some very very strong magic, um, very very capable individuals, right? Um, I would say um, as far as fan Game of Thrones would be a good PL one uh, example. Um, you know, everything's kind of grounded in reality, even though there's fantastical, um, you know, parts of it. Um, so, yeah, I think Game of Thrones is a good example for fantasy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, PL2 could be, you know, it, it, PL2 to me is kind of like a similar to D&D, kind of how, you know, the the powers in D&D and uh, just kind of that that kind of era you know the witcher uh sci-fi could be you know star wars would be a good pl2 um star wars uh star trek would probably be pl1 mm -hmm. um even though there's you know advanced technology people aren't doing crazy things um so yeah i think i think uh, that would be um that would be yeah. suitable yeah i remember i remember talking with the guy who's making a universal game called sagas and i i told i told him to um be to to have a certain approach when it comes to what's considered advanced technology because at the time mm -hmm. he was using modern day as the baseline but yeah. it's important to consider that what may look like advanced technology in something like say Star Trek for the people in that yeah. universe that's mundane yeah mm -hmm. oh yeah the the way the way here is in hardships uh, technology is not a um Hugh, well, so in Dwarven's Deep, or Dwar, um, Caverns Deep, and uh, I'm sorry, Dungeons, Dungeons Deep and Caverns Old. <laughs> sometimes I get what 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 way is that uh, said? No, um, I'd hate to see you no. say your say your own project's <laughs> name three times right. fast. Right, uh, but yeah, so it's um there there is a a hint of uh, technology in this game, which is not what you would expect in most fantasy games um you know there is a a, a you know if you look at the map there's a there's a you know tracks for a steam powered uh small rail system there mm -hmm. um that sort of thing so there are hints of advanced technology which you would not consider maybe fantasy typically um, and that's explained in in the book, and uh, you know, Heroes and Hardships itself has a pretty robust uh, technology system 
um, where there's, you know, uh, what's considered medieval, modern, and futuristic, and how those mix with each other, uh, that sort of thing. So, yeah. I'm glad for that because, as I've talked with you in the past about, I think I think a lot of people have a very limited view of um, fantasy. Mm-hmm. Um, specific to the, to the point where I've j- I've joked about how, despite everybody going trying trying to say that medieval is what it your medieval Europe is what you're supposed to be doing, um, mm-hmm. for some reason we're not allowed to use gunpowder, even though gunpowder was a th- was already a thing yeah. at that point in time. It's yeah. weird. I think it's just basically people, you know, and I think fantasy has grown out of certain you know, intellectual properties and they just kind of assume like, you know, Lord of the Rings or whatever. Mm -hmm. And since, since that didn't have certain things that people, you know, shy away from things that are a little different than that. And I think like, uh, you know, settings like for instance, Eberron really kind of changed some people's perception of what can, what a fantasy game can be. And I think there should be no limits on the only limit should be your imagination. And that's kind of, you know, where heroes and hardships came in to allow you to do anything you could really think of. Whereas, you know, you have a lot of other um, games that are even limit, even universal systems. It's like hard to mix and match those two technology levels because it's just not designed to be able to do that. Um, And so, yeah, I think, um, I think, uh, you know, this setting shows some of that where there, you know, there's advanced technology, like there's a, a kind of like almost a, a phone system, um, you know, more like uh, the old, you know, direct line, you know, somebody on a switchboard. But there, there is this where there's like um, communication tubes between the two, you know, uh, or the, the three uh, halls and, you know, people can walk up and they say, I want to go to this junction point. Let me talk to them. So that that is a one one thing in the setting that I can think of offhand. Mm-hmm. But there's also like magical crafting of of items, and the secrets of the sacred stone is um, you know kind of where that comes in. So yeah, and you mentioned you mentioned before that it, that there's going to be something of a of a corruption system. Yes. Now. I'm guess I'm I'm guessing that this that this is bi- that this is built with this setting in mind. So, could you go into yeah. how that how that's going to work? Since there's a lot of ways to do corruption in RPGs. Yep, there is. So, um, so the so the way like the way I've always designed my subsystems, um, is they kind of build off of each other. So the corruption system works primarily, um, for those that are uh, that have read Heroes and Hardships, it, it works like um, primarily the wound system and the surge system. So um, you roll, well, actually, the thing rolls against you, the corruption, and then you do your resistance or whatever. Mm-hmm. And based on those results, you could become corrupted. Uh, and then you roll on tables to what those actual corruptions are. Uh, the higher you roll, the less severe they are. The lower you roll, the worse they are. Um, and what happens is there are three types of corruption. There's physical corruption, mental corruption, and spiritual corruption. Now, spiritual corruption, I kind of think of as like Lord of the Rings um, in general, right? Mm-hmm. This thing, you really think you're doing the right thing. You know, you you want that ring. You want to do. You want that ring because, hey, it'll save your people, sort of thing. And all the results that come out of spiritual corruption kind of have something like that. Um, it's different flavors of that in certain different ways, but it, it more lends itself to that, um, you know, Lord of the Rings style corruption. And as a GM, you can say, well, this is a form of spiritual corruption. If you were doing Lord of the Rings, I would only have spiritual corruption, probably. And so um, you would, you know, every, every uh, you decide as a GM what type of corruption it is. So that tells you what tables you roll on to, to generate corruption. So if it's all spiritual corruption, you're never going to get something weird where your body changes into a monster. 
Okay. Um, whereas if you have uh, the physical corruption piece, that can happen. Like you can change drastically physically, like into, you know, and then now we're talking about 40K style corruption uh, a lot, where you just, you know, your face turns into a monstrosity, you grow limbs, that sort of thing. So that is also a um, potential uh, thing. And then mental corruption. Also, uh, is kind of, uh, you know, uh, similar to spiritual corruption, but it's more just like your intellect and what you know and how you think instead of like that spiritual kind of, of guidance that might draw you to something. So, mm -hmm. and you meant, you mentioned the whole, <laughs> you mentioned the whole thing of mutation. So it, it mm -hmm. does sound like there is the possibility of doing the physical corruption if somebody wants. Oh, yes. To. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, the physical corruption and all three will be used in this game. But um, yeah, if, if you wanted just that physical corruption for, and you, you could use it easily as a mutation system because that's essentially what it is. Um, and so, some of them are beneficial, at least partly, right? Like many, you know, mutations are, you know, you gain, you gain strength, but you look, you know, like a monster, right? And so that and you know, you get a corruption flaw every time that happens. And then you certain, after you get a certain amount of flaws, you have to start, you know, making checks to, you know, keep your sanity, keep, you know, yourself from completely being overwhelmed. And it's like almost like death, right? At least to the player it is because you lose control of your character. Um, so, yeah, that, that all kind of works together. You can do those physical mutations only if you wanted because the only thing that tells you what chart to kind of roll on is the source of the of the corruption and that's up to the gm mm -hmm. and i could i could def i could definitely see that especially since one of the one of the things that you highlighted in the kickstarter in fact gave it its own pdf is the concept of mm -hmm. becoming a death seeker yeah, Death Seekers is, is that's kind of more that mental uh, corruption, and that's uh, you've just seen too much. You you've done you've done things that um, are totally faux pas to your society, uh, and uh, it's time to go and do your thing. Now, this this is a this is a concept. This is not a new concept, right? Um, you can you see these things in Legend of the Five Rings, as mm -hmm. you know, uh, Death Seekers are. Um, uh, whatever the line calls them, I the, da um, the damned, the damned, the mm damned. -hmm. Um, so, so are you are you talking about those that uh, that are tainted with Shadowland taint? Um, yeah, they've been the, the, they've been tainted too much, and yeah, the, there's those, and then there's there's the lion um, dishonored um, people. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, there, there, you know, and and. 40k or not 40k but uh warhammer fantasy dwarves have something you know similar yeah the uh, slayers. but yeah so so these are these are people that uh really they can gain their honor back by doing heroic sacrifice essentially and that could be from it could very well be from corruption it's like well i'm corrupted i'm probably not going to last very long so i might as well go do this thing so um at least i can die with honor yeah the which does mean the possibility that somebody could make a setting equivalent of Gotrek Gurnison. you know, a, sl a slayer who's mm -hmm. tr who's trying to trying to find the honorable death as a, as anyone who does the Slayer's Oath does. The problem is he's really bad at it because he's really really <laughs> shit at dying. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Possible. Yeah. Absolutely possible. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd also and. I'd also bring up the Le the Legion of the Dead from Dragon Age. Oh, yeah, I'm it's... not that familiar with Dragon Age. It's been a while since I've yeah. played those games, but yeah, yeah. There's and... a there's a lot of analogs to that. Yeah. Like I say, it's not a new concept. Yeah, but yeah. Since, since you since we brought up Game of Thrones, um, the Night's Watch is one other yeah. thing that can be um, brought brought up. Although some of I'd say a the Night's Watch would be tricky in this case because a lot of people who take the black don't necessarily do don't necessarily do it because they have a death wish. Yeah. Um, it's just it's better than sitting in a prison or being executed or whatever, right? Some people do it to avoid the hangman. Some people do it mm -hmm. because they think they'll get they'll um, get respect there that they can't anywhere else. Yep. Oh. 
but the con- the concept has been pre- has been present in one form or another or another. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah, for sure. Especially since honor culture is o- is always been big with fantasy dwarves, and it would appear to me that that's no ex- that's no exception with th- with this setup. Yeah, for for some, for some, um, I not all so not all dwarves behave the same way. Um, it's a it's more of a instead of a, a you know a ancestry or a species type of, of thing. It's more of a, a cultural type of thing, mm-hmm. and a lot of, the thing about this setting is a lot of these dwarves had very little contact or no contact with each other um, until like you know 700 years ago when this great cataclysm came and they all kind of found this place Mm -hmm. and so and so they can have wildly different cultures um that have you know it's it's kind of progressed over the last few hundred years but uh you know maybe they weren't an honor-based culture maybe they're more human maybe they're more you know kind of in in their in their dealings and stuff um so that that's where i wanted to kind of change things where there's a lot more variety of how the dwarves live what they believe in and and that sort of thing right Mm -hmm. because i mean if if i just made another dwarven you know, supplement where everybody's dwarves, everybody, you know, follows the Tolkien, you know, version of dwarves, then it's kind of, you know, it kind of stinks, you know, because it's like, well, what's, what's, what's uh, unique about this setting where you would play this, this setting instead of some other setting, right? So. Mm-hmm. That's completely understandable. Now, with that, with that in mind, mm-hmm. given, how, given how, um, ver- how all over the place, one could potentially go with he- with heroes and hardships. Yep. Are there are there any are there any um, restrictions or guidances that you give GMs to maintain the theme when it comes to the setting? Yeah, I mean there there is definitely uh, guidances based on you know kind of the overall you know what the overall culture is because there is an overall culture how people interact with each other how different clans will interact with each other. Um, that sort of thing, you know, uh, it's clear that in the in the setting, there's no elves, no dwarves, n- or I'm sorry, no elves, no humans, anything else like that. There's golems, uh, which have dwarven souls that have been uh, forced into non-organic material. It could be steel, it could be gold, it could be whatever. Uh, those exist in limited quantity. Um, but there's no sentient life forms uh, that you sh- could play um, baseline in this game. Now, there are talk of elves, and there's like humans, elves, halflings. We all know they exist, but they don't exist here. So my idea was this, this setting could be put in any other setting you want. Any other setting. Would not matter. Um, and Because it's so isolated from other places. You could put this in Forgotten Realms if you wanted to. Like, here are the dwarves, they're in this isolated underground place, you know, what happened up top, it's never, this supplement will never never say specifically what the cataclysm was, if it happened, if there's, you know, can the, can the dwarves actually go back to the surface, you know, what is there? So that's kind of up to the GM to decide, um, because in the setting, uh, all the records were were lost in this great fire of their library. Uh, and so many of the actual firsthand accounts of what happened to the cataclysm have lost. It's been too long. There's no dwarf still alive that saw it. So everything is kind of hearsay and, and that sort of thing. So, you know, you can say that the cataclysm never happened. They were, you know, this, for some reason, all these dwarves came here um, and, Okay, let's go to the surface, and now you have the surface adventure, and you change everything completely in any setting you want. So that that's the idea of kind of um, that I had as well. You could really, you know, you could connect it to almost everything. Mm-hmm. That certainly makes sense. Now, wh- I know that there's the Ankeg um, warrior example given on mm-hmm. the Kickstarter, but what yes. are some of the other potential threats you could see? Because Given the setup that you have, it's feasible that you could do just about anything with the delves. Yes. Which I um, feel like was by design. 
Yeah. Uh, so, so the ANCAG is going to be something you see. Uh, obviously, there's in in the art on the on the Kickstarter page. There's two pieces of art with ANCAGs in them, mm-hmm. so that's clear. Um, I have shared around a, kind of like a um, a test layout page uh, of the first part of the first first page of the adventure part, and you see where you're actually. Um, it starts kind of in media res where you're chasing a uh, dwarven warrior who uh, supposedly killed his family. And when you catch him, you realize that he is completely mutated. Uh, He has scaled hands. He has a forked tongue. He has a bulbous face with mismatched eyes, that sort of thing. So you're going to see a lot of corrupted um, type of um, adversaries in the adventure. Um, so, and that's not even the delving part. And I don't want to, I don't want to give too much away from the delves, but you know, some, I would say some, um, kind of things that you would consider, you know, kind of common and some things that might s- surprise you, um, that, that you can, you can find and uh, for, you know, adversaries of different types. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I could, I could certainly see that. Within now, within that, even th- even though you mentioned that this is meant to be both both linear and non-linear, is it a case mm-hmm. where there's certain highlights that are that would be hit as you go th- as you go through the adventure? Yeah, you definitely you there's definitely parts you have to to take on to to make it any sense, right? Because it's not like a sandbox where you just go and do your own thing, right? There is a there is a narrative. Um, all my games have narratives. I, uh, you know, I know that some, some part of, you know, role playing prefer just completely make their own thing up, but, you know, uh, and it's, it's not that you can't do that. It's just kind of, uh, it comes with their, their costs. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, you can do, you can do whatever you want. Right. But you know, there, there is a thing to solve, yeah. right. There is a thing to do. Mm-hmm. Um, how you do that is completely up to you. Um, there are definitely things that you need to do in the adventure to finish it. <laughs> right. Um, but how you do that is I try to leave that up, you know, with as many options as possible. I try to make that, you know, as open, like it, it's very, it, there's not going to be a lot of, well, you have to, you know, you got to, it's like, not like a train car. You go this car, that car, this car, that car. It's more like, well, you can go just anywhere and do it in any order. Um, as long as, you know, it makes sense to do so. Right. So, mm-hmm. and then there's, there, and it's not all just one thing too. There's like side things going on that, you know, if you do this thing, it might help you do this other thing which might get you your goal easier or something like that, right? Yeah. And I am cu- I am curious if um if you do if you do plan on having some charts about about the kind of just ra- just random threats that can happen when you're doing these sort of delvings deep underground. Yeah, if it, it, yeah, like I like I said earlier, if if there is if you're in the fourth hall particularly, the the only one you can reach right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you do that, then there is a list of like, you know, what might be down here. What, uh, you know, what's the terrain like? What is, you know, what other kind of threats can you find besides like things um, that you know I might attack you or something? There's always, you know, uh, probably structural or, you know, um, you know, hey, there's a big, you know, this this is a you know, not a trap, say, but, you know, it would act like a trap. You step on this, it breaks away, you might fall into a chasm, things like that. So, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, the, the, it, it, there is a, a bit of that in there, too, that kind of once you are in that and it'll describe that hall in more detail um, about what might be there. And it doesn't say necess- and, and besides the part where it's like very specific that you have to to go into to to do for the adventure but like if you like are doing other things it kind of what things can you find what things are there uh what secrets might it you know open up and stuff so Mm -hmm. so with that with that in mind um what are you shooting for as far as the page count for both dungeons deep and caverns old as well as secrets of the sacred stone 
So they both kind of combine in the same. They're going to be kind of combined in the in the same book, mm. and so it'll be a uh, hundred ish pages, probably a little a little higher. It depends on how how it will be kind of laid out. Depends on what the page count actually will be. Uh, I do. I am trying to keep my page count at a certain certain level for cost reasons um so you might see a, a separate digital bestiary for instance if we're running you know large but the the it'll probably be you know 75 percent or 70 percent adventure uh with the contextual setting and the, the rest split up bet between rules and and uh you know just setting stuff mm-hmm and I will, I will certainly be keeping an eye out for it. Um, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window for the project? I, I would like, um, you know, Kickstarter states one year from, you know, from when it launched um, with, with a much bigger project. But, you know, honestly, it was a lot further along. The core rule book, I got it um, done, you know, five or six months ahead, of, you know, early. Mm-hmm. Um, got it to people. So I think I think people are going to see digital fulfillment sometime in the early spring and uh, not too long after that uh, physical fulfillment. And I don't um, I'm not 100 percent sure how where it's going to be printed yet. So probably it's going to end up being uh, able to go out a lot quicker than last time, because uh, last time there was a lot of uh, freight d issues that we had to deal with from coming from you know, Eastern Europe to the United States, which that takes a long time. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I think you're going to see everything delivered. Uh, at least uh, I would say my hope is spring. Um, now, I don't want to give an exact, you know, date because I have no idea. Um, but I think you're going to see you're going to see it come uh, pretty quick um, in, in the spring. Particularly, I think I think you'll see everything finished. Um, I don't think it'll take the entire year. If that happens, then there's something's went, you know, wrong, um, you know, with something. So, uh, but I, I think everything in the spring. Yeah, with I the could... with the digital with the digital version coming out ahead of time. Yeah, I could I could see that. And with that in mind, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness once again here <laughs> yeah no thanks for having me i appreciate it and anytime you see fit to return the door is always open as i often say around here drinking is not mandatory but it is encouraged <laughs> and of That's course good. a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come on to the show and enjoy the madness and there will be plenty more where that came from as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>